Massive beasts the size of mountain ranges, their steps launching shockwaves far and wide. Gargantuan creatures battling it out, a crowd of tiny humans screaming terror beneath their feet. A galleon swallowed whole by jaws of colossal proportions. Who does not get excited by that? Me. Yeah, it's me, Mr. Allergic to Fun. But before you leave an angry comment, spit on the keyboard and report me to the authorities, this is not a bait and switch. I may not share in a seemingly rather common human trait of loving things for their incredible size, but I have nothing against the concept either. In fact, I believe that with the proper setup and care, huge beings can be used to great effect. Or, to be more precise, a difference in size is what presents unique narrative opportunities, as well as contributes to a particular atmosphere. Sphere. In this video, I'll explore this concept and see what works, what doesn't, and what might, with my usual focus on realism. The most basic, but one of the more crucial elements concerning this topic is plausibility. While not all people will start to think about whether or not a particular beast is even capable of life, I do think it is the toughest pill to swallow and one the audience has to wrestle with right off the bat. But plausibility is not dependent on a single thing, it is a closely linked collection of factors including structural physics, movement, ecology, and sustainability. To make the suspension of this belief the easiest for the viewers, readers, or listeners, the world builder would be best served to contend with all four and make the monster realistic. For anyone who might disagree with my use of this term, you can't really say internally consistent here now, can you? With my indisputable intellectual superiority proven, let's see what we can discern from the four arbitrary aspect categories I just mentioned, starting with structural physics. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue as well as the other three, but it is probably the most descriptive. The creature should have the structural integrity to not collapse under its own weight. Possibly the most apparent problem people might have with an animal of gigantic proportions. There is a physical limit as to how much weight usual materials like bones, cartilage, and kitten can bear without deformation or shattering, which is significantly influenced by the gravity of the setting. There are a couple of tools out there that help a world builder construct a planet, including determining its gravity, like SF Calc Sheet. However, in the vast majority of cases, worlds closely resemble Earth conditions, for which we have the most reference points. It only makes sense if we tackle the subject from this angle first. Let's see. Nowadays, the largest animal to walk on land is the African bush elephant, but our home has seen numerous species far exceeding their size. Paraceratherium strolled around in Eurasia just a couple dozen million years ago, and Titanosaurus roamed the world towards the end of the Cretaceous. With a few caveats added, we can more or less discern the Pedagotitan or the Argentinosaurus as the plausible maximums concerning size, or creatures that are very close to that at the very least. I mentioned both because estimation techniques are not exactly accurate, and as far as I know, it is still debated which one was larger, and what their measurements actually were. Fairly sizable ranges of 30 to 40 meters in length and about 50 to 95 metric tons are attributed to the two beasts, which are incredibly huge, even at the lower end, though they are nowhere near many of the more fantastical creatures. When we look at the skeletons of these colossal animals, we can see a clear trend. Their massive weight is supported by pillar-like legs positioned directly under the body to ease the strain on their muscles. Consider the replacement of the marrow cavity with cancellous bone and the sizable cushion pads softening their steps, even at the quote-unquote small size of the elephant. It is clear that special adaptations are needed just to enable locomotion and keep them from collapsing under their own mass. When designing a land animal of comparable proportions, it is a good idea to follow the design of these and similar species. When giving beasts an incredible bug, it will also have an effect on what form makes sense from a logistical standpoint. After a certain height, most things will be below them, and at best a small subset of stuff at the same level. Therefore, it is only logical that the creatures do not have an upright stature towering above everything, as they would have difficulty interacting with the world around them. The aforementioned animals are good examples for this. Beyond their powerful build, they also have means to reach the ground, and little of their actual height goes to waste. But there are a lot of other problems when simply increasing the size of a monster with no further modifications. Just because something is larger does not mean it is proportionally stronger as well. 
A bone that is twice the size but not provide twice the structural strength. The square cube though is something that often comes up in discussion of creature design and it is most applicable here. It basically states that if something is increased in size, its volume will increase faster than its surface area. So the larger bone would suffer under its own significantly increased mass in addition to anything it might have to pop up. After a while it all gets out of hand, placing a hard limit on how large something can get without crumbling. It is also important to note that the animals I listed not that long ago were all vertebrates. Indeed, having a solid internal structure is key in achieving impressive proportions. Exoskeletons are not only overly restrictive, but materials like kitten would add a lot of extra weight to the already cumbersome critter when used in the amounts required to keep it from cracking open and letting the internal organs splatter onto the pavement. Large arthropods are a topic in and of their own, as they suffer from a huge amount of problems, so I'll not get into it right now. When dealing with colossal land monsters, a strong foundation that still allows freedom of movement is an irreplaceable asset, and for this for this reason an endoskeleton is generally preferable, unless we get into super materials or magic, that is. The creation of imaginary elements and compounds is the saving grace of many skyscraper-sized creatures. While designing the specific properties is a commendable effort, these materials are also serviceable on the basis of consistency. A set amount of stress they can withstand, an approximation of their weight as well as texture are generally enough and can be easily inserted into a world through diegetic means. That being said, they are, beyond the shadow of a doubt, a double-edged blade. In an attempt to make something big, you also introduced a non-destructible, relatively light form of matter or two. Like most aspects of world building, this has an effect on the rest of the setting and can very rarely be handled in isolation. Even if existing solely in the context of massive beings, these materials would be extremely precious and valuable highly sought after, with far-reaching implications for tools, weapons and construction, among many other fields. Naturally, their usefulness is largely dependent on how strong these elements or compounds actually are and how advanced the technology is in the setting, but being completely useless is unlikely, to say the least. So, super materials are a relatively simple way to fix a major problem, but have a cascading effect for the rest of the world. However, they are not the be all end all of solutions, as some potential issues are left unaddressed. Movement is one such issue. All too often do we see huge monsters beat each other up with movements unbecoming of their sheer size. They might move a bit slower, but they jump about, change directions while charging, sometimes even fly or float. This is not only a deeply unrealistic way to portray massive beasts. It also partially defeats the purpose of making them big. When they mechanically work like a regular sized animal, their gargantuan stature is more of a cosmetic change than one with substance. From a believability perspective, it is difficult to buy extremely agile, mountain-sized creatures. From the angle of realism, it is now impossible under Earth conditions, mostly due to inertia. Not only would it take tremendous force to even begin moving the giant body parts of these hawking animals, there's also the issue of stopping. They would be slow, sluggish, expending a lot of energy just to move about. However, when it comes to walking, they have the benefit of the earth stopping their limbs. If it comes to striking, running, turning, even just looking around, the air resistance is far from enough to bring their body parts to a halt. Their limbs would keep moving in the direction they were essentially launched, unless the creatures themselves force them to stop, if they even can. One wrong motion and their balance is as good as gone. At worst, they could topple over, but even just the restriction of finer movement is hindrance enough. This is another effect of the square cube law. Increased size comes with exponentially higher volume and a disproportionately low amount of extra strength. They could only maintain control if they move slowly and meticulously, even if they would theoretically have the ability of sudden actions. On the bright side, it is what we would expect when looking at something massive, a slow-moving behemoth. It would be their reality, unless you use some imaginary material or magic to reduce their weight, which… Uh, well, that's not something without consequence. You may get rid of a significant amount of problems caused by inertia, a light but colossal monster has its fair share of issues. A low density can make its interaction with the atmosphere 
troublesome if the creature has close to the same amount of total mass as a comparable unit of air, gravity would not have the same effect on them. The image of a slightly deflated balloon comes to mind, falling slowly, barely having an effect on the terrain it walks through. If it accidentally bumps into a skyscraper, the building would remain mostly intact, while the beast would be pushed to the side. But even if it falls over, the damage caused would be minimal. If it throws a punch, there would quite literally, not be much weight behind it. Now, this is an interesting idea for a creature and one certainly viable for gliders or flyers, which we will cover a bit later, but it would be anemic compared to anything that has actual mass. To play around with the movement of creatures, as well as to justify some of their design elements without the introduction of super materials, modifying the planet they inhabit is a good option. While it also significantly affects how lesser creatures interact with the world, it can take a lot of weight off of the shoulders of giants, semi-literally. Lower gravity allows for them to amass a larger bulk without being crushed and still move about relatively freely. Depending on the differences, colossal animals on that planet may move at about the same speed and with similar agility to medium-sized animals here on Earth. Alternatively, the differences might be just enough to push the maximum proportions beyond those of our sauropods. The trick is simple consistency when applying the gravitational changes to everything on the globe. And one more thing. With a lower gravity, air would be thinner. If the creatures are built after real animals and require oxygen or any form of gas exchange, they would have difficulty breathing. Now, this is a potential problem for immense monsters under Earth conditions as well, and I will go over some solutions when I talk about ecology too, but there is a relatively easy fix here. Change the composition of the air, which you should probably do anyway for the sake of verisimilitude. Not all planets should have current Earth air. Either way, increasing the concentration of the desired gas is a simple solution. This also has a global effect, mind you and definitely makes oxygen tanks necessary for any humans who happen to visit, but does explain how moving hills manage to survive on a lung full. Interestingly, increasing gravity might also provide a solution for some massive beasts, specifically when it comes to gliding and flight. I guess it is as good a time as any to move away from land animals for a bit. Powered flight, and even just riding the currents, require very specialized anatomy. This is a lifestyle where weight has a crucial effect on performance, and therefore increasing in size is not always feasible or advantageous. To our current knowledge, the Quetzalcoatlus was the largest flying animal to have ever existed on our planet. Estimations vary widely, but a roughly 10 meter wingspan seems to be the consensus, with a body weight of around 200 to 250 kilograms. Massive beasts that had dedicated launching mechanisms to get themselves off the ground. This is probably the logical extreme feasible under these conditions, for an animal that is still capable of functioning. With some other specific modifications through genetic engineering or creation, it is likely possible to pump those numbers a bit higher. However, that risks the creature being able to live, compete, survive and maintain a viable niche. As with land animals, super materials and magic are also options. Ultralight but durable matter would be invaluable in this regard, even more so than for other lifestyles. The only tangible difference here would be that maximum weight will always be lower than for animals without the capacity to fly or glide. Changing gravity, on the other hand, would have an appreciably distinct outcome. With the planet having a lower attraction force, it would be easier to become airborne. However, with a thinner atmosphere, it would be more difficult to stay in the air. Gliding could potentially be completely off the table for anything remotely large, and even wing flaps generate a fraction of the lift. Funnily enough, since leaving the ground is so easy, large animals would not really have much of a benefit for even attempting to fly. Smaller, maneuverable beings would have a niche, but expending so much energy to maintain their slow and largely pointless flight would render massive beasts earthbound. Well, as earthbound as the gravity restricts them. Conversely, a high gravity planet would have quite the opposite effect. As one would expect, leaving the ground would be significantly harder and the crushing weight of a gigantic body would eliminate some options. 
However, once the creature manages to get airborne, either by jumping off an elevation, having a launch mechanism, or generating lighter than air gases, staying up would be a cakewalk. If the gravity is high enough, that is. Since the atmosphere would be more compressed, it would be thicker, potentially almost like a liquid. Powered flight would be an option, but just gliding ad infinitum might be the bleeding edge in evolution. Once up in the air, even their own weight would be of lesser concern, as their mass does not rest on their own body parts. There is no force pushing down on the specific portion of their legs or belly. They are held aloft by something far more malleable than the hard surface. If these massive beasts begin to fly or glide at a very young age, their weight is even less of a factor. They may never have to leave the safety of the skies, gathering everything they need from other beings floating around them, perhaps occasionally swooping down for a drink. An interesting concept for sure, and since sky veils are not an uncommon element in fiction, this is a great way to justify them without magic or super materials. Naturally, these effects can be achieved without modifying gravity, by taking a look at the atmosphere instead. Thickening it without increasing gravity could lead to some rather interesting flyers, which do not need to be as hyper adapted to flight as animals here on Earth are. That being said, competition would likely streamline them given the time. Aerial fish is an intriguing concept, that is for sure. Speaking of fish, let's talk a bit about aquatic animals too. This is a bit of a cheat code for massive beasts. Just take a look at creatures like whales, especially blue whales. Water pressure is the thing they need to worry about rather than supporting their own mass. As long as they stay in the water, incredible size is a lot easier not only to design, but to justify. Now, there is a cap, albeit much higher than for terrestrial creatures. Their mass, or more importantly, their density plays a big role in swimming. Make them too dense, and they sink to the bottom and ultimately get crushed under their own weight. Buoyancy is an important thing when it comes to aquatic life, and many fish have some way to control that, predominantly using their air bladders. Marine mammals use their lungs for this purpose beyond breathing. It would be a good idea to give something to your custom colossal deep sea horror as well, as diving and rising are mandatory abilities to have. Water movement is not hindered that much by a massive body. Maneuverability, sure, that would be impacted, but that will never be the strong suit of something gigantic. However, just one half-hearted swing of a gargantuan tail will propel them quite nicely through the liquid, water or otherwise. They would likely be capable of building up impressive speed with relatively little effort. While there are some other factors that can and will limit maximum size in the water, these are not tied to movement or body structure. These are results of their environment or their lifestyle, which I have loosely grouped together as the next part of the video. Let's discuss their ecology. Let's get one thing out of the way right off the bat. Something that is slightly tied to their build, but fits here a lot better. Remember the square cube law? Well, that is kind of an issue in terms of thermodynamics. A humongous beast will have a very high volume of matter and will therefore have trouble cooling itself down, or in some rare cases, warming itself up. Indeed, managing heat is a big problem for large animals, even at the size of elephants. Mud beds and trunk showers are effective enough to keep them from overheating under the harsh sun of Africa, but pumping up their size will make things a lot harder. Something immense would slowly cook under the searing heat of a desert sun. Their proportions would not only make cooling itself more problematic, but would also eliminate quite a few viable ways to do that. There would be far fewer shades that could cover them. They would require far more cold material to roll around in. Ectothermic animals have an edge in this regard, but they would struggle with actually acquiring the heat and then keeping enough of it not to die during a cooler period. Ginormous things need to either live in an environment that does not cook or freeze them, or have an effective way to regulate their body temperature. Now, it is important to know that cooling off is generally more of a problem, especially for endothermic animals. When the environment is cold, good insulation is the only thing they will need. Since their body does produce heat on its own, keeping that will suffice. However, insulation will generally not be enough in sweltering heat, as some of that external warmth will get through, pushing internal temperatures even higher, and cooling down would be off the table. 
Additionally, good insulation is a death sentence for ectothermic beasts, as internal heat is not generated and the external one is barely getting through. Regulating body heat is often overlooked, and the secondary reason I roll my eyes harder than dice whenever I see something gigantic in the barren desert. The primary reason is food. Perhaps the most apparent question to even the most unquestioning audience member is what does that thing even eat? Now, there are a couple of ways in which increasing in size will give one an advantage. More defense against predators, the capacity to hunt larger prey, the ability to bully lesser animals and acquire resources that way. In some cases, it is also directly linked to food sources that become available or more accessible with a larger body. Think giraffes or basking sharks. The former can reach branches that are too high for lesser creatures, while the latter can filter through a lot more water with its massive jaws. The point is that colossal monsters do not exist in a vacuum and need a lot of sustenance. Not only that, but they need to be able to compete with other species that tap into the same resources. Towering predators are rarely a good idea, as they would need an exorbitant amount of prey meat to survive. I have occasionally talked about this, but it bears repeating. Energy transfer between trophic levels is highly inefficient at a value of roughly 10%. This means that only a fraction of the energy stored by an animal or plant can be utilized by its consumer. While it does not translate one to one in terms of biomass, a bigger body does require far more energy to move and maintain bodily processes. And this is only in terms of breaking even and stagnating for a single individual, let alone growth and a sustainable population, but we'll discuss that more in depth a bit later. The thing is, not every environment can support giants. Anything barren, any place that does not have an extensive range of primary producers, is disqualified right off the bat. Places like deserts or frozen wastelands are great examples. However, polar ecosystems show us how much proximity to the ocean can swing that balance. Polar bears would be nowhere near the size they are if seals weren't fattened by marine fish, but they are still dwarfed by a good chunk of fictional animals, so I'd still be careful about populating the top of the ice sheets. Do so instead somewhere nice, with a lot of vegetation or any other alternative producers. Perhaps things that use chemosynthesis. Seas with abundant plankton, fields with clouds of insects. Any place where food is abundant and not too hard to get, as that is also a potential problem. Grazing, filter feeding, swallowing large masses of smaller creatures, perhaps ambushing, would be great ways for giants to acquire their meal. Actively hunting individuals is ill-advised in most scenarios, as not only would it burn a huge amount of calories, it would be extremely inefficient if the prey is significantly smaller. Again, energy transfer inefficiency is a huge bottleneck. In a nutshell, not only is the abundance of food important, but also the method of acquiring it. Another bodily function behemoths could have a problem with is respiration. We've briefly touched on this when discussing a thin atmosphere, but it extends far beyond that. When talking about a colossal mass of flesh, if it functions anything like earth animals, they will need a hearty supply of oxygen. The first problem is simply getting enough. Lungs and even gills are great for this purpose, if they are sizable enough, but things like an insect's trachea system don't even come close. Another notch against giant arthropods. Now, while lungs and gills are excellent, as I've stated, there might be an issue in simply getting the volume of air or water through them. Since gills have a direct connection to the dissolved oxygen, increasing their size and allowing the free flow of liquid around them should generally suffice. Lungs on the other hand are connected to the atmosphere indirectly and therefore increasing capacity might not be enough. Most animals of extreme size have some form of adaptation to have the efficiency with which they can utilize their air intake. Whales have specially adapted lungs and enlarged blood vessels that push their respiratory efficiency to about 90%. In other words, they can extract almost all of the oxygen from the air they breathe. Sauropods, on the other hand, had anatomical similarities with current-day birds. They possessed air sacs combined with their skeletal structure, with most of them situated in their neck. This not only increased the volume of air they could breathe in, but also provided more surface area for gas exchange. It also doubled as a cooling system 
system, so it ties back nicely to the issue of temperature regulation. However, while great solutions, these are not necessarily the only options. A simple adaptation where the air has to travel less, where the avenues of intake are more extensive, paired with a more rapid breeding pattern could also be effective for a highly active monster. That being said, this certainly does not allow for the largest of beasts, since by increasing the size of the lungs, moving them is also costlier. Burning precious calories to breed faster instead of more efficiently is unaffordable at the higher end of body size, but would be quite useful for a somewhat large predator or a prey animal that is actively hunted. This kind of concludes our section on ecological problems that arise from a massive increase in size, but the next segment is closely linked to the same topic. These are strictly external factors, so I elected to separate them into what I would call their sustainability mainly population size and evolution. I'm sure all of you have heard that inbreeding is not a good thing. With lower genetic variation, harmful recessive genes have a higher chance to be passed on, and resilience takes a sledgehammer to the head. Species that are severely inbred are much more easily wiped out by a single disease or an environmental change. All of their members are equally susceptible to these negative effects and either live or die essentially as one. Therefore, for the longevity of a species, it is essential that they do not have their nearly identical eggs in a single basket. And yes, unless the setting is some high concept with pure energy beings or some radically different approach to life, genetics are going to be a reality. If reproduction is a thing, and living beings are not created or pumped out through artificial means, the recombination of genes will be a driving force and all the laws of evolution will play a role, even if the world is a result of intelligent design. So, if we are talking about a species, something that is meant to endure the test of time, they will need to have a healthy population size. Now, due to their proportions, it may be unfeasible to have larger groups inhabit the same area. Depending on the abundance of resources and how much they actually need to survive, a solitary lifestyle might be necessary. Whatever the case, migration can play a big role in the genetic flow of a species, but there will have to be quite a few individuals of the opposite gender for the traveling giants to come across. The amount of distance they can move is a significant factor as to how extensive their effective range is how much space their species or population as a whole can utilize. But ultimately, it all comes down to numbers. How many of these creatures exist in a proximity that enables reproduction? Tens of thousands? That is great for their continued success, but might be an enormous, unsustainable drain on the local ecosystem. What about thousands? Well, not as good, but if they were never affected by a genetic bottleneck and they are sufficiently diverse, it is certainly viable. A lot lower strain on their environment as well. What if we decrease their numbers to a couple hundred? That is when we dip into dangerous territory. Genetic drift hangs above like the sword of Damocles. Variations are at a far greater risk of disappearing, slowly reducing the total diversity of their genetics. They may be okay for the foreseeable future, but it might only take a single catastrophe to lead them down the road to inbreeding. But it can be worse. When we are talking about sub-100 individuals, inbreeding is either already a fact, or is soon to be. Even if they manage to boost their population size to more acceptable numbers, there's no getting back the gene combinations they lost and random mutations will not fill in that void anytime soon. Cheetahs are probably the best example for this, and while they are not particularly big, they illustrate the core of the problem very well. There were likely two events in the history of cheetahs that massively decreased their overall genetic diversity. It is theorized that their species experienced the founder effect very early on. Essentially, a smaller population of animals got isolated from the rest of their kin, and the gene flow between them ceased. While they managed to survive and even bolster their numbers, they started off with a fraction of their initial gene pool. A second bottleneck was likely caused by climate change during the late place to seen. Current day cheetahs are at a point where they have trouble reproducing as a significant amount of their sperm is malformed. They may be doomed to extinction simply by the rise of detrimental genetics, and some external factor could speed up that process any day. A sad state of affairs, but definitely highlights by a low population, even if temporary, can lead to the complete annihilation of a species. 
Speaking of the complete annihilation of a species, there are other ways a particular creature may cease to exist, so to speak. They can absolutely be outcompeted by other animals, or may even evolve into more efficient, better adapted species over time, which potentially means a smaller one. Now, these possibilities do not come into play short term, for the most part anyway. If we consider evolutionary changes, they can take anywhere from a couple thousand years to millions. Naturally, more complex adaptations require more time to appear and spread throughout the population. If the environment changes, which it absolutely could, depending on the time frame, these massive creatures will have to migrate or change with it. Since they are specialized to one lifestyle, which is being huge, they are very limited in their flexibility. Even a small decrease in the overall food available may send them down a doom spiral. If their habitat remains mostly the same or changes very slowly, they have a chance to adapt. In essence, due to the massive time span involved, this is more of a tool than a restriction. It is rare for a story to cover multiple millennia, let alone millions of years, and the world builder is generally better served to focus on the relevant period rather than go into minute details about the preceding natural history. Unless it affects a plot, of course. However, massive creatures can be designed for the past, with only their remains present at the current date. Properly were building these ancient giants, their habitat and lifestyle at the time, and introducing the species they evolved into can give a lot of depth to the world, making it feel truly lived in. With magic or technology involved, an extinct colossus might just be the gateway to introduce animals that could no longer persist in the current environment, but are artificially brought back for one reason or another. Jurassic Park comes to mind as an example, which might not be paleontologically accurate, but it does represent an excellent story that can be told with such a premise. Just to be clear, I'm only talking about the first one here, I would not call any of the other ones excellent. However, extinction is quite a final state in most cases and might not be the route the world builder wishes to take. This is a complex thing to ensure, we have discussed many factors already that can add the lineage of a massive monster. Well, here's one more thing to throw onto the pile, a competitor. While in some cases a big body is exactly the thing that enables a creature to thrive, it can be a double-edged blade. As I've said, it is a very restrictive strategy. It takes a lot of specific adaptations, makes them relatively sluggish and cumbersome. A huge target or a less efficient design that cannot keep up. The loss of a single offspring can be an incredibly big deal. They take a long time to mature and are far more vulnerable in the meantime, suffering from a lot of the adaptational drawbacks without the advantage of size. All in all, one should be careful about what other animals they introduce into a biome with gargantuan species. If they compete for the same resources, the lesser creatures should not consume them at a rate which endangers the survival of the big ones. There should not be predators that can hunt them faster than they reproduce. They should be part of an at least semi-stable system, as the most specialized species are always the first ones to go when change inevitably comes. Granted, competition does pressure their evolution, so extinction is not the only outcome. A general rule of thumb for these sorts of animals is that they should be one of the primary considerations when designing an environment. They pose restrictions on what the world builder can do with any given habitat as their unique conditions have to be justified. It is much easier to design around them rather than force them into something pre-established. At least, this would be my advice based on some prior experience. Yes, despite my lack of enthusiasm for kaijus and towering behemoths, I did try my hand at including them in various projects over the years. Why? Well, as I've said, I do believe they can be used to great effect in a story and can provide a lot of interesting opportunities when added to a world. There is the option of using them as… well monsters, making them battle each other, or mechs, chase around humans, or run amok in populated areas, which all have entertainment value for sure. And while I do not usually enjoy these approaches myself, I can certainly see why others would, but there are other ways to capitalize on these creatures which I feel are more effective. I have, on occasion, confessed how much of a sucker I am for interspecies interactions. 
I find the connection between two entities who perceive the world in radically different ways fascinating and cooperation or affection all the more meaningful as a result. This clashing of worlds can be made more impactful by a difference in size. There is a level of awe the smaller creature will likely experience when faced with a giant, be it mixed with fear or happiness. The audience can glean some of that feeling if the book, movie, game or any other piece of art properly conveys it. I think the trick to this is moderation on most fronts. The first scene will always be the most impactful. It should capitalize on both the differences and the similarities and let the scenario breathe. Accent it with a build-up or kick the doors open with a sudden tonal shift. There are many ways to approach it, but keep in mind that there will be diminishing returns. Used sparingly in new situations, highlighting different aspects of the nature or juxtaposing them with the much smaller humans. These are all options through which their effectiveness can be maintained for some time, but featuring them prominently or constantly can take away some of what makes them special. After a while, they run the risk of seeming mundane, nothing more than the norm, especially if everything they interact with is also massive. I fear this approach, the excessive use of these monsters, loses sight of why size matters and wastes a lot of opportunities. If the environment is the only thing that signals scale, if the city could just as well be switched for a background that makes the kaiju seem normal-sized animals and have little to no effect on what's happening, what is even the point? My point is that context is very important. There should be elements of the story that tether us to our appropriately sized characters and do not let us forget the difference in scale. That, after all, is the main appeal, is it not? That is not to say a story cannot be excellent if only gigantic things interact with other gigantic things, but at that point size is more of a cosmetic choice rather than a significant element of the art piece. Except there is the option to use normal sized things sparingly in a similar vein, making reminders more impactful, which is a rarely utilized concept and not the only one either. If it is size difference we are really after, well, the title has likely already spoiled this, but there is an alternative approach to this whole topic that I rarely see, which is downscaling everything but the environment. Now, there are a couple of movies and games that explore the idea of humans shrunken down the minuscule size, and while I love the concept, that is not really what I meant to talk about here. This is a subtler change of size, simply making the point of view characters a little more compact. Shot. It could be as little as 10-20% to that would still make a huge difference from a world building perspective, since most of the narrative effectiveness of large creatures comes from their relative size, this allows for a greater discrepancy without altering much of the world or introducing super materials or magic. An African bush elephant is massive as it is, now imagine how huge it would seem if you were half your current size. Granted, this has a ripple effect throughout the setting, or rather how the setting interacts with the smaller people. While movement would be mostly unimpeded and there would be no special adaptations needed even when halving size, there are a few other impacts. These people would be appreciably weaker and while requiring smaller tools and equipment does somewhat compensate for that, the natural world is not as kind. Labor-intensive jobs like mining or woodcutting would be more taxing, even if the same amount of materials lasts longer. Animals would become more dangerous across the board, which might affect domestication, and traversing the terrain would also be more of an obstacle. Granted, the same space would be able to sustain a higher population, so it is certainly not without benefit. I have toyed with this idea numerous times over the years, and I find it a really interesting concept. The changes would range from subtle to somewhat significant, but rarely drastic. I do think adjusting for a size decrease is relatively intuitive, and the effects can be extrapolated without too much issue. While still a complete overhaul of the world, it is one of the easier ones to world build. So, if the approach is relatively simple and allows for the realistic inclusion of colossal beasts, 
or at the very least, relatively colossal ones, then why is it not used more often? Well, I can think of two drawbacks. The first one would be a level of separation. While granting the audience point of view characters that are exactly like them is never a necessity, it does allow for more people to connect with what is shown. They can more easily imagine themselves in the shoes of those individuals, since if they switch places at that moment, they would experience everything exactly the same. Now, I don't think this is reason enough to dismiss this idea. In fact, I have a general aversion towards the notion that people cannot relate to characters that are not like them in every way. I believe that the vast majority of people have the willingness to connect with any living being if the story gives them reason to care. But I digress. Media is often about reaching the widest audience possible, so I can see why some creators would opt not to live with the opportunity. Plus, there is another catch that could dissuade a few other people. It has to do with exposition, really, as it is relatively difficult to convey this idea without explicitly mentioning it. In case the change is small, it might be enough to allude to it in a diegetic way. It would only occur to those that really do care and I doubt that monsters slightly bigger than what seems to be physically possible would bother those that do not. But if the change appreciably affects the shrunken people's ability to interact with the world, it definitely requires some clever writing. If the audience realizes the state of the world halfway through the story, that could really take them out of the experience. It is also a challenge to introduce the idea without it seeming like a mistake. People might just assume that you weren't aware of something, or that you made an error, and continue reading or watching assuming every character shares their size. But these are the challenges that can lead to a unique and well-crafted piece of art. Pressures and diamonds, eh? As I struggle to suppress the pedantic asshole in me that wants to mention how this allegory is bad because diamonds should not be as valuable as they are, we have reached the end of this video. This is certainly an extensive topic, and we have not even touched on a number of common elements linked to massive beasts, like cities on the backs of behemoths and the like. Alas, those topics will have to wait a while longer, as I'd rather give everything the time to breathe and avoid cramming half-baked ideas into a single episode. Anyway, I hope you liked this one, Discord and Patreon links in the description for anyone interested. Next world bidding poll will be up on the Discord in a day or two. Hope to see you when I release that one, or anything else in the meantime, and happy world bidding. Bye.